Let's talk about the second problem that uh, Chris raises with respect to the autonomous desires. Again, this is section A of the paper. Um, and this move that he's going to make here is important because it's a very central move uh, to, he's going to make in basically the rest of the paper. And actually, the thing we talked about in the last video, um, that comes up too in the other parts of the argument, but this one's pretty central. So, I'm uh, going to say real quick how it fits in overall, talk a little bit about the desire itself, and then one of the sort of side cases. So, remember that the first problem we had was basically that because the manipulation creates desires in you through this kind of back channel, um, you don't have any way of knowing why it is you're actually wanting to do stuff. And that's going to interfere with autonomy because if you don't know why you want to act, you can't tell whether or not it, that possible action is in accordance with your values. So you might think, though, that he's going a little bit too far, right? He's, he's going overboard on this um, not being able to do anything about it, right? Maybe we can have desires that arise because of ads, but then make a sort of autonomous choice about whether we want to endorse those desires. Remember the whole endorsement thing, second order desire thing that come, that's central to the idea of autonomy, the idea that some of our desires we think about and decide, yeah, those are the desires, those are the ones that really reflect who I am. So you might think that you could make that move with the Carl's Jr. one, right? You find yourself with the desire to go to Carl's Jr. because you've seen this ad. And you could ask yourself, well, do I really want to go to Carl's Jr.? I mean, maybe you know the reason. Maybe you don't, you're not misled about thinking that it's just a desire for the hamburgers. You're like, yeah, that was kind of lame that they tricked me in this way, but I'm hungry. I want a hamburger. Uh, couldn't I decide that I want to go? Well, that's where the second move comes in. And this, I haven't written it out verbatim the way he says it, and he says it a couple of different ways in different places. Um, it's a mouthful. I wish I had a nice name for it, so if any of you have a good idea for a nice name for this, uh, let me know. So the idea is that everybody who's autonomous is going to have something like this desire. You're going to you basically don't want to be manipulated. You want to be making your own choices. And the way that plays out in this kind of situation is through this second order desire. So I want not to want things on the basis of reasons slash desires, which arise because of manipulation um, for reasons I can't accept. I left out the part about without your knowledge, blah, blah, blah. So, again, you have the ad plus the, you know, sort of drive states that make you sort of then have the desire, you know, uh, right, do the thing, you know, do the thing the advertisement wants you to do. And the idea so even if when you realize that you have this desire and you realize, you know, that you have it because of that, even then, Chris thinks you're not going to be able to say, yeah, well, you know, it came about in this kind of stupid way, but I still endorse it because this is going to get in the way of that, right? The reason why you want this is because you were manipulated and the manipulation was not the kind of manipulation that you're okay with. A couple of things about the uh, about this desire. First, obviously, it is a second order desire, right? It's a desire about another desire, right? It's a desire about which desires you have. So again, that's very important to autonomy. The other interesting part of this is this caveat, right? You don't want to be having desires that arise through manipulation when the manipulation happens for reasons which you can't accept. And obviously when you see that, the, your thought should be, okay, so Crisp obviously thinks that there's some cases in which the manipulation is happening for reasons which we can accept, right? And there's plenty of these cases, right? You might, for example, have some sort of bad habit that it's really hard to break, but maybe a friend, you know, can sort of like play you really well and get you to do stuff, 
you might be totally fine with her doing that to help you break that habit, right? So she, you know, behaves towards you in ways that reinforce you not doing the thing that uh, that you don't want to be doing. And she's doing it in a sort of sneaky way, right? So it's manipulation. But you're totally fine with that, okay? The other case, you know, the one that Chris actually talks about in the, in the paper is the... Um, the actor, right? The skilled actor. And this is pretty intuitive, right? When you go see, you know, a movie or, a, you know, I guess people go see movies or you go to a play or whatever, you pay money to see actors portraying characters and doing and doing it in a way that make you actually have certain kinds of desires, right? So you, um, you know, the you're watching a romantic comedy, right? And the you know, the second act, there's that misunderstanding, the cute couple looks like they're never going to be together, and you're like, oh, I want them to be together, right? So now you have a desire that came about because the actors are doing a good job of, you know, sort of portraying a young couple in love, uh, you know, cinematography is helping out and all that good stuff, writing is okay, you know? So you have this desire that's caused in you by the actor, you know, doing sort of manipulative things, um, but you're totally fine with that, right? You want to be manipulated in that way. That's if you didn't feel anything when you went to see a movie like that, you you know you think your money is wasted, right? That's the whole point. Is we want to have these sort of sympathetic and empathetic experiences. So in that kind of case, again, the actor is causing you to feel things and causing you to have desires, right? That are you know it looks like a kind of manipulation, but you're totally fine with the way that it's happening. And that's the difference between the advertising and the actor, because Chris asserts that, you know, nobody is ever going to be fine with being manipulated in the way that uh, advertising, advertising is manipulated. So let's just think really quickly about whether or not that's actually true. If the situation is as he portrays it, where this whole system is like super sneaky and you have no control over what you want, you're, you are in fact absolutely helpless to um, have, you know, you're going to have this desire when you see the ad. Because If things are working in the way that Crisp is portraying, where you have absolutely no control over whether or not you have this desire, right? You see the ad and you're just helpless. Um, okay, fine. That's the kind of manipulation that because you are so helpless um, and because, you know, it's manipulating you into doing something that's spending money, etc., blah, blah, blah. Sure, this, maybe this, this is, sure, maybe it is implausible that there's anybody who could be like, yeah, I'm totally fine with that kind of manipulation. But there was a lot of assumptions I just baked in there, right? I mean, this whole picture of what the advertising is doing is probably false, right? Um, it, it This is not what's going on. It's probably something, and you marketers can tell me more about this, but it's probably something more like, you know, just sort of attracting your attention or, you know, pairing a stimulus with a kind of positive feeling, but not this like super sneaky, like you're helpless to actually... Um, have the desires or to you're helpless to not have the desires so if we you know kind of back off of that super strong picture of what's going on and have something that's more realistic it's you know might be a more open question whether or not um, people can be okay with manipulation right um, for example somebody who's in marketing uh, might have a very different experience when they you know watch Super Bowl ads or something right some of us might like, you know, watch some commercial with like a truck and, you know, it's making us feel all weepy and like, why do I want to buy this truck? That's lame, right? But other people, you know, who are in marketing might be like, ah, well played. You know, they have like an appreciation for that kind of manipulation. And they're like, yeah, I do want to buy the truck. Good job, guys. You know, that could potentially be the sort of thing that they're okay with, right? So a lot's going to turn on the actual sort of mechanism by which the ad works. Um, and you'll notice what I just said there was nothing that actually objects to Crisp's theory, right? You could, we could all agree that, um, and I'm not saying we should, but we could agree that Crisp has got it right. If some form of advertising actually could do this, then it would not be okay. 
And then we say, but no actual advertising does that. And we can talk about, you know, the real life advertising and maybe use some of this framework to help out. And also, you know, as technology gets better, marketing gets better. Um, once, you know, our brains can be stimulated by billboards, you know, through some sort of uh, microwave technology or whatever. If technology gets to a point where advertisers really are able to kind of impose desires upon us, then, you know, crisps arguments are going to be, you know, spot on. We're not to that point yet, and let's hope we're never to that point, but it's still probably useful to help us think about the ordinary cases that we do face.